Good morning, everybody. Hopefully, I'll do a quick talk. Um, there's a few. Let, let me just start on one that I wanted to share, uh, which happened on Easter morning, this past Easter. And I would have done it then, but uh, I'm pretty much really done with the videos. But uh, as I was getting ready and I posted on Easter morning, regular Easter message, and uh, as I was walking here doing my work, I don't want to say it's a vision. I'll say it this way. I had a very strong memory that came out of nowhere. And it was of a marathon runner back in the 70s that was on Wide World of Sports. And I'm not a, uh, uh, the only sport I was a fan of throughout my whole life was boxing and fighting and stuff like that, the, whatever it is, the UFC. And all. But for whatever reason, I saw. This runner, I could have Googled it, but I, I'll i tell it to you the way I didn't Google it. I think his name was Waddle or Dave Waddle, whatever. He was known for running. He used to wear a hat, and he would pass up the guy at the end of the marathon, and he would do a sprint like the last mile of the marathon, and he'd win. Now, why I was thinking of that, there was no reason. So the image was the runner passing up the guy right at the end. And so I knew, okay, and this maybe can help explain some of the way these things work. So when you have, some people will have open visions, they will see things, or you will have an impression. So I could say that was an impression. And, and because it was so out of left field, I knew, okay, there's going to be something significant to that. And so that was in the morning on a Sunday morning, posting the Sunday Easter. And within a few minutes later, that Sunday, I watched St. Patrick's Cathedral Church out of New York City live, which I'll rotate and Sunday I did. And so I thought, well, let me pay attention to the verses because I don't always listen to everything. And one of the verses was from John's Gospel, which was Easter Sunday this past Easter. And it said, when Peter and John were going to the tomb of Jesus after they heard about the resurrection, his body is not there. And it's a famous story. Uh, Peter was running in front of John, but then the writer, John himself, testifies, but then John passes him up right at the end. And so I thought, okay, that was the simple significance. Uh, to me, I thought, well, I'd, you know, should I do a video? <laughs> but maybe it's just helping people to understand that there's so much that goes on in the realm of the church that people have written off because of abuse and charlatanism and money and greed and prosperity. Like the gospel kind of has become changed in the minds of so many people as just such a major scam. So uh, maybe it's helpful if I share those little things like that, which happen to many people. And so we have opportunity to just have a little forum to put it on. Now, I did not get into the whole eclipse thing, meaning we recently had the full eclipse at the time of the making of this video. People would be familiar if you see in the future, you wouldn't. But it was the first full eclipse that we would have in many years uh, before it happens again. So, and there were a lot of Christians on both sides of how they should discuss it. So some came up with some different, felt it was important because of the cities that the eclipse would pass over and the names of the cities, Nineveh and different things like that. Others would say, see, it was a fake prophecy. Now, because I'm speaking about it after the fact, it would be very easy for me to say, oh, see, it was fake or see, it was real. But what came to my mind was when the star came over Christ at the birth of Christ, the birth narrative in the Gospels, the significance of the star was indeed that God, the signs in the heavens that God does use, and we read about that in Genesis, and I discussed that before. Now, the birth of Christ would have taken place and would have been significant as it has been, whether the star was there or not. 
but the star was simply there for a sign. And if I were to mention, do you think this eclipse is going to be a sign of things to come? What I, my thought was, because I'm a news reader, that the sign of things to come is written all over the place. Even if you are not a Christian, today you might see another step forward to basically World War III, depending on how Israel responds to its attack over the weekend by Iran, which was kind of an unprecedented uh, attack. It's the first time the state of Iran would launch attack from its own territory in Israel. Now, I stay out of mixing a lot of that in with the particular, like we say sometimes a Zionist view of things. My view is try to be gracious to all people and to be against all war. But to understand things do happen. Now, if you looked at the last few years of the whole world going on, many, many reasons that whether or not an eclipse had a significant sign or not, you didn't need the eclipse. Meaning whether the star appeared at the time of Christ or not, the significance of Christ and what he did in redemption would not be diminished in any way. And so the thing that I would say would be those that were looking for an eclipse or saying, is it going to be significant? And then right after it's passing, many people said, oh, see, it was fake. I would simply say, whether you had one or not, the signs of where we're at, world, globally, are there. Meaning, you're closer to World War Three than ever. Okay, that's just the fact of it. Now, the main thing I got, which is, I wanted to share that little experience with you. I did write a bunch of notes. Uh, let me hit on it a little bit. Uh, some of the significance, too, on the recent eclipse thing was there was an earthquake in New Jersey that preceded the eclipse. And, and the path of the eclipse, I liked it because it's like a prayer path that I pray when I'm, and the eclipse came out of Texas and went straight into the northeast right up into the New York City Northeast area. And and when I saw the pattern of it, I, that's like a prayer spot when I say from the south to the north. I liked that because it was in the session. But there was an earthquake, a surprisingly strong earthquake in New Jersey out of a little, the epicenter was out of a little town. But that earthquake rocked New York City. And after I looked at a few of those things, I was, you know, as I pray, so many scriptures there shall come one out of the north from the rising of the sun. He will call upon my name. He will come upon princes as upon mortar and the coastland shall wait for his law. All types of words and prophecies when I'm praying for many years out of Isaiah. So when I saw the path, then I saw that earthquake. Then the only building that was really damaged. Now I had to write this so I'd remember it. It was built in the 1760s. Or in 1760, by Colonel John Taylor, and it was used as a grain storage for soldiers during the war. That building, I thought I wrote the city, let me see, uh, for the Revolutionary War, it's called Taylor's Mill, Reddington Township, New Jersey, 264-year-old building. And Washington fed the troops for the Revolutionary War. It was a storehouse. That building was damaged the most, from what I saw on the news, than any other building. And so you had that rocking and that shaking. And, and that building represents the founding principles of our country. Most should be familiar with the history. And it, it was, you could see a significance that that thing was uh, broken torn down. Sort of like a, a confluence of different things that you could say it's like a time of a shaking. Nations and countries, the whole history of man, Roman Empire and others. I'm not a right-wing zealot or left-wing zealot. I'll make this note that for YouTube if they ever see this or any of them. When I advocated for so many social justice issues over the years, 
linked throughout so many sites, so many videos, multiple video sites. But when YouTube might see something they didn't like and say, oh, we got rid of your channel, you might have gotten rid of videos that advocated. I had named so many names of corruption, judges, connections, people that quit their jobs because uh, it was criminal activity. And then they'd see the videos. I made them in front of homes of uh, officers. Stood there, said, now look, you know what happened? It was criminal activity. And he quit, quit his job, left town. Now I'm not saying just because of that. He's back in town again. Now I'm just saying that, that there's many like that. Judges and things and over a period of, you know, 15 years, strewn out on this, if you will, blockchain of links and videos and everything. So when someone on the left side of the aisle or the right side of the aisle that owns these platforms sees something pro their side or anti their side and they, oh, let's remove the whole channel. That's why I have no trust in a lot of those platforms. And that's why I tried to do multiple links, multiple videos. But just to say, you do damage when you remove something like that. Because if any of those cases that would come to court, whether it's a homicide, a corruption, a killing of a person, and I advocated, people see those. And then when you, if you remove a whole channel, they could say, oh, yeah, he made that video, but that YouTube or whatever, they deemed it that it wasn't true. Now, they could use that because they removed all those videos because they were not true. Well, they were true. And I understand the platform might remove them because they're mad. Oh, we saw something that we didn't like. But so you do damage when people are doing business, whether it's platforms or a bank. If you have a million in the bank, which I don't know, and you make a bad deposit, they, oh, oh, your million is gone. Wait a minute. Correct the bad deposit. So I, I wanted to make that note because I don't know how many more I'm, I'm going to do with these videos at all. Uh, I hit that. Let's see. Is that true now? Birth of, okay. I mentioned Sh Oxford House, which is a recovery program. My friend Shrek, he, I've seen him the last few weeks, and I heard he was staying at a rehab, and he's doing good. He's clean, you know, not using. And he's at the Oxford House in Corpus Christi. And I said, that's great, Shrek, because I was discussing that. I'll talk a little bit. Uh, let me... Uh, Road, Eric. I can't do more. I got the Easter. My friend Mike, who is the artist, I got a few. He's been writing it or making some more art the last few weeks. Right after I spoke about one of the social justice issues, and I mentioned the courthouse and homicide rate, just it was an off the cuff thing. Mike showed me one of his most recent paintings. I kid you not, it was an Oasis County courthouse. And it was a new art he's doing. And it showed a homeless guy on a bench. This was just like cartoon art. And he was stopped because they found a homicide. And in the painting, I didn't even have time to explain all to Mike. He wrote, and the homicide rate is up 90%. I said, you know, Mike, I just recently spoke on that. I spoke about New Oasis County, the homicide rate. That was the Caleb Harris video, I think the last video I did. And Mike had hit, uh, done that. Uh, sorry, I was watching a TED talk. Somebody quoted, I liked it. It was on time management, but he quoted Sartre, John Paul Sartre. He quoted the wrong way, Sartre. And then over the years, I said, if you ever hear me quote Sartre, famous philosopher, but these were nihilists, Sartre and uh, the, the other one, Sartre and Camus. They were nihilists, but either way, it was a TED talk on time management. And I noticed as he spoke on it, it, though he said it wrong, maybe like me, it got, you spell that word Sartre, John Paul Sartre. And so sometimes when I'm writing it to remember the spelling, I'll say Sartre, though it's Sartre. But I, it, so he's an intellectual and he was critical of Christianity, but he said Sartre. But I think he was a good man overall. But the two that he was quoting on time management, it mixed in with it, was Camus. Now both Camus and Sartre are nihilists, nihilist philosophers, that there's nothing to life and so forth. And so he used that as perspective. And I thought, 
I, I thought of one incident and I said, we can argue for the reality of an afterlife, which we certainly do as Christians. We argue from the historical first century. We, you argue through the testimony of man down through the ages. There's one experience I've watched on YouTube this last year. And over the 30 or 40 years, there were so many doctors who had experiences about uh, NDEs, which are called near-death experiences, that ultimately a particular doctor, I don't remember his name, he decided to catalog it and write a book, that there were so many that they could no longer just say it was a fluke. They had to recognize the near-death experiences as a particular phenomenon that takes place. And there was enough evidence that these were real. Now, he might be a Christian or not, I don't know. I saw him speak. But I'll give you one example of why some that are from the nihilistic perspective would say, well, when people die, we understand that they give accounts that they see their loved ones and on the deathbed. And, uh, oh, I see. So, and that what they said was the, the nihilistic view would be <laughs> there's certain things in the brain. And as the person dies, all those synapses are popping and it's bringing back memories of things. And so that's how they say it's not really some proof of afterlife. But the one that stuck with me, and there's so many like this, there was a particular doctor, whether Christian or not, I don't know. But when he came into the operating room, the lady was what we say coded, dead. They worked on her and they eventually brought her back. <laughs> and she said, oh, doctor, I saw you when you came in the room. Now she was dead when he came in the room. And she said, I saw you drop your pen from your shirt and it rolled into the corner and you had to pick it up. Now that doctor knew that did happen. So that could not have been something going off in her head at death. And they had so many of those that showed from that particular point of view that there's more to it. Now we as Christians certainly know there's more to it. They finally had to document and make these experiences. They are now acceptable in the medical field as real experiences that they don't have explanations for, but they can't talk them away anymore. So that's, you know, coming over many years. My friend Craig passed away. Another Craig, not Craig Martin, but a homeless friend of mine, Craig. And that's a TED Talk. I got the Easter. I wanted to get the Easter one out. <laughs> I wanted to mention uh, ND. I'm going to talk in a minute. Uh, what did we have here? Oh, the building. I got Taylor's thing. Birth of Christ Shrek. Eric's my friend. He gave a great testimony. I should mention this because it's fresh on my mind. Silk Road. I'm not. I do a lot of research on websites and the history of it, and I don't ever do dark web. But because I uh, search for internet websites and a lot of times dark web will come up as documentaries explaining what it is and if this is a case and i'll advocate for him here so i won't have a chance brother i can't remember your full name he started what was called the silk road uh Ulrich or i wish i remember his name but it was such an interesting documentary and there are multiple ones on it the silk road was the first underground website that was uh, open website to buy and sell anything. And there was drugs and all types of things on that particular website called Silk Road that people were anonymously buying things online, drugs and so forth. But other things were put on that website that were illegal. And that website was started by this particular guy that's in prison now. And he was from Austin. Now, he had a libertarian mindset. He was a smart kid, grew up in Austin, went to college, I think Pennsylvania, but didn't know what his purpose in life was going to be. And he came back to Texas, I guess, after he graduated. And then he, he said, let's get involved in Bitcoin. I can't explain all. It was the beginning of Bitcoin. And he said, let's use it. Let's use it on this website that he created. Now, what happened was the case was very controversial because once it came out, a uh, uh, magazine called Gawker, which I'm not familiar with, but they did a publication on it and talked about the Silk Road, you can buy anything. And it got the attention of uh, Chuck Schumer, Senator out of New York, Democratic Senator and others. 
And they, when they realized this was existing, they said, we need to shut it down. Well, what happened was the FBI, CIA, and government, they did this elaborate thing, you know, to, to track who was this guy running the website called the Silk Road, and it went by various names. So it's very interesting how they finally tracked him down and arrested him. I think it was when he was in a coffee shop in California. But what happened was, during the case, it's one of the corruption things I deal with, there were two FBI officials, two government officials that extorted money illegally from the Bitcoin. Too much for me to explain, but the blockchain technology. So they had anonymous personas on the site and there were criminal activity going on with the people that were investigating me. They even made false hits that they took pictures of someone, said we carried out a hit, and then he was extorted for money, the one they put in prison, that he had to pay uh, these guys. So they were robbing a lot of money and they were involved in the technology of it with pseudo, their real undercover identities and other ones that they were hiding from the FBI to extort money. Now you had a lot of corruption and the initial, there's many videos on it and many, the movie was made, I didn't watch the movie. But when they initially apprehended him right from the start, they knew because of the experience of others like this, that they had to catch him before he shut his laptop off. Because once he shut it off, they'd lose all the evidence. So the apprehension shows in multiple videos, you know, dramatized, that they distracted him and grabbed his laptop. The, the initial warrant that you would give to get that laptop was violated. So right from the start, if you're going to arrest someone after the arrest, you have the right then to confiscate whatever's on them. Or you're going to give a warrant to somebody, you give them the warrant. You're really not allowed to run into a house or to run into a coffee shop, distract someone because you want to get his laptop before he closes it. And when he's distracted, you grab it. That would be an illegal uh, taking of that evidence. That's from the start. Overall, there were many other problems in that case. It's the Silk Road uh, website case. Ultimately, they gave this kid, I say he's now 30-something, he's still in prison. They gave him two life terms plus 40 years so he could never get out of prison. Now, they're advocating for him to be released. He's already done like 10 years. The two FBI agents in that case got seven years apiece or six years. And I would simply say this. If there was so much wrong and corrupt in that case, and much of the evidence was digital evidence, chat room evidence, everything else. Once you recognize that your own investigators who had knowledge of Bitcoin and so forth, the government had people that knew how to do all this. You could manipulate chat rooms. You could manipulate data. You could manipulate all of that. And the fact that he got life in prison without the possibility of parole, that was an overkill, if you will. So I do advocate for him. I left a note he still has an Instagram and a Facebook page so I'm, I left a note for that and I wanted to say I think it's time uh, to, for him to be pardoned and to be released whether it's the governor of Texas or whether the president whoever had to do something like that because uh, that seems like an injustice there's a lot of problems with that case I didn't mention them all now I'm hoping to reshare this in the future so let me get something that is benefit because I would like to keep that note out that Whenever a platform, you have a problem with me and you say he said something, you do, if you want to remove it, and that's been done before, but you do damage, you do damage to the cases where I advocated, uh, where no one else advocated for those people. And I've done that. I've done that. I've done videos in front of, uh, I did the judge, I have his name, uh, and he was involved with the drug dealing in the cartels out of Mexico. And I gave his name. It's all it's all online still. It's all on YouTube unless they decide, oh, let's remove this guy's channel. And he had to leave. He left. But then he came back. And I had his name. I won't give it again. I said, you need to step down. So these were corruption cases that I spoke about for many years. Did you ever get... I 
in one of my most recent videos I was shot at here the last two months. Now that was one that I wasn't expecting. But yes, somebody shot a shotgun and hit the side of the house. It's one of the videos the last few months. So I'm just saying not to, I'm, I'm just saying, be careful before you say, oh, we see something we don't like. Because there's things of value that you might like and things that you say, oh, he's on the other side. My, uh, when we advocate, I'm glad I got to mention the Silk Road case. I felt that was important. It felt worth it because this, I say, kid, he's still in prison. And I, I just think uh, uh, I would advocate for a pardon for him. Now, in all these dealings, uh, I didn't hit everything I could hit. In all of these dealings, we as Christians, as a church, we want to advocate for justice and for righteousness. Not a right wing or a left wing. Or, we want to advocate for all people. We want to say we don't want to show vengeance to anybody. We want to say that things are going to take place in the world and, and that the kingdom of God, it transcends all those barriers and those that are, they feel like they're rooted in a sense of justice. Maybe they're advocating for a particular cause. But others would say, but the cause you are advocating for harms people, which in many times these things do. But yet they're, they're rooted in a sense of we're advocating for people, but in their advocation of it, if you're condoning the destruction of human life, well, you're not advocating for old people. You understand? If you're advocating for a side that says, I'm pro something or anti something. You have to also look about all the people that would be in that group of the cause that you're advocating for. So we advocate as Christians. We want life for people, for old people. It, the kingdom of God is not, not about physical violence at all. It's about the rule of God into the nations of the earth. It's about mercy and compassion. It's about not... It is indeed about not being mean to people because they might be involved in a type of lifestyle that Christians would say that's unacceptable according to the biblical standard. But at the same time, we don't want to hate those people. We don't want to despise those people. But we might not be able as Christians to say, well, we support a particular lifestyle, but we love all people. We advocate and say, as Jesus said to the woman at the, the woman at the well, <laughs> she was in sin, but he would, she would believe at the end. Or the woman taking adultery, who has no man condemn thee, no man will, need do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. So Jesus would recognize there are things that are sinful, and not hide those, and say, but I'm going to forgive you. But he wouldn't justify the lifestyle. So in in our communication to the nations of the earth and the things that we're called to do as believers. We want to make sure we are advocating. And when we speak the truth, we speak it in love. I've had talks over the years with many uh, different people, Muslim friends. And I say friends because they were friends. I met them. But I would say, well, this is what the church says and this is how history has distorted it, my friend. And So I would, it wasn't there for me to go through the whole history of it, and I'm familiar with the history of it. I had a friend of mine that uh, said, John, he's a Christian friend, I've seen him recently, but he said that Muslim guy that was here just a few years ago at the mission, there was a guy named Roman, and he showed up, a very interesting guy, and he told the guys, I used to be Christian, but now I'm Muslim, and he was just from however his experience was. So I spoke to him a few times, but I didn't. I advocated the gospel, but I was friends. And then I went back and they said, oh, he's looking for you. He liked talking to you, John. I said, oh, I'm not sure when I'm going to be back. This was a few years back. So when I've had those conversations, they're gracious. They're not compromising the gospel. Or whether it's a Jewish friend or anybody. Or whatever lifestyle. <laughs> you advocate. You speak the truth in love. You have a conversation. You don't cut people off. That's the difficulty I have with what I mentioned already in the video.
you cut people off because you say they're this. And then they advocated for people that no one else was speaking out for. And then you said, oh, we didn't know. Well, <laughs> that's the difficulty. So I'm glad I got to share that. I did want to get that experience out. Uh, one of my homeless friends by the name of Craig died. Craig was around for many years. And I don't remember Craig's last name. He was a very hard worker throughout his whole life. Craig was older in his late 60s, I would say. But he was one of the best workers, and people used to pick Craig up for work. Then about a year or so ago, he got very sick, lost a lot of weight, and then he just passed away. He was a gracious soul, Craig. Okay, uh, let me see. Okay, I did share a few little uh, things. I also, uh, I'm not sure if this is accurate, but I believe I saw a picture even earlier today online on TikTok. That, that lightning had struck the Statue of Liberty right before the earthquake. The significance of that little earthquake that took place, which was a big earthquake for the Northeast, and then the other things that were taking place. To me, whether those things happen or not, we're a, we have enough signs that there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. It may be even today as I make, I'll give the date later on this, all right? Um, all right, I did a little sarcasm. We, do, uh, the, I like philosophy. I just, I'm, I'm finishing up our recent uh, uh, study on philosophy, the old study, but I reposted it. I liked it. I got to read. I felt the Lord wanted me to read the verses on that post, and I never do that, you know, anymore. But I like the verses. It talked about the patterns of things, and when uh, God instructed Moses to build the tabernacle. To build all things according to the pattern that I showed you in the mount. And when David was uh, given instructions to build, uh, I think I posted, this would have been the last philosophy post. And at the end of it, I had verses. I think it was Chronicles 28. But that's the chapter where David is given instruction to Solomon to build. And build all things according to the pattern. And, and he's given Solomon instructions. So I added those in because I was talking about Plato and ideas and patterns. And then I was trying to give the more biblical view of it, though I don't despise, you know, the philosophical view of those things. And so in all that we're doing, build all things according to the pattern that God gave to you on the mount. Now, I read this morning, I did read that chapter, which would be out of the ordinary because it was Chronicles. And I remembered, I think I read it one time when I was visiting Pops, who passed away. He had his Bible open. I said, I'm going to go read that tonight, Pops. And there was a note in my Bible at that chapter, Pops, 2014. I said, wow, 10 years ago. That might have been the last time I read that chapter in my slow progression through reading. And yet I quote a verse from it every day. As I read it, because it's one that build all things, I think it was the one build all things according to the pattern. Or the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the ark, be strong and do it. Now, in, as I read the chapter earlier this morning, that Chronicles chapter, and I came across it, I thought, you know, I quote that verse every day. And I had read, the last time I read the chapter was in 2014, the best of my recollection. Now, not, nothing special. I thought, and as I was meditating on that, I thought, what are the odds I quote it every day for the last 10 years since it stuck with me? The one I just quoted. Because in the evening, there's a prayer quote in a session, like there is in the morning. Build all things according to the pattern that everything would be ordered in short. And so as I meditated and I thought of that, I said, I've been quoting this for the last 10 years. And if you asked me where it was, I would have known. And I thought of it not to say, oh, look how great this. I thought of it to say, there's got to be God working it. Because, you know, meaning if God is maximizing some of the things, I, well, I'm going to close some of the things on time management and being in the zone. And, and it's interesting because when you begin your life or your day, if you do not begin it, with purpose and push through. I get up awfully early. Today was 4.20 or something like that. But a friend of mine said, oh, John, I got up at 9. I said, oh, I'd never get up. He said, well, sometimes I get up at 6. 
I said, that's still way too late for me. If that ever happens to me, I'm like, oh, it's so late. But that's all right. I'm just not judging anybody. But you get into a zone where you push through. And, and you push through in the sense of you want to have it accomplished. Oh, let me talk a few more minutes. The other day, I don't know why I was thinking of this. It's not to testify myself, but to give you an example. I never liked school. I did not like going to school. I liked my friends. But I remembered when they asked me in high school, you have a guidance counselor, and they would always say, Okay, these are the courses you need if you're going to go to college. From the first year I had a guidance counselor, whatever year that starts, in sophomore year, I remember adamantly saying, I am never going to college. He must have thought, well, this guy has something wrong with this kid. The reason, and I was meditating, why did I always think that? Because I always thought of school as something that I wanted to get done or finish. Now, over the years, I became a student on my own and got so many books. But I saw it as... This has got to be done. You got to graduate from high school, son. Okay, let's get this done. And then when my friends are talking college, I used to think to myself, are you crazy? We want to finish this to get on with whatever we got to do. That's how I seen it. That's how I was meditating on that. In the fire department, my father was a captain in the North Brogan, New Jersey fire department. And I remember thinking at the last few years of school, I always knew the job was a very good job. And it was. But I thought, why was I thinking that? No college. I remember. I thought, if I test for the fire department, and my dad had a book called the Arco Civil Service Test Tutor from the 70s. When I got to Texas, the guys here had never heard of that book. But my dad had one. It was an older one. And I thought, you know what, Dad? I'm going to just study this book and take one test not f four years of college, that way I could get it done. That's what I was looking for, to get everything done quickly. <laughs> I meditated on that. So I remember studying that book, I don't have it anymore, but it was a civil service test tutor to get on the fire department. But then when 18 rolled around, they were not testing there. So I eventually joined the Navy, came to Texas. When they hired here in Texas, I got on. And I scored high. I always scored high, but I remember I still had that book. I thought everybody knew about it. I was the only one that knew about that book at that time when I tested at the Kingsville, Kingsville Fire Department in the early 80s. And then I thought, not to promote myself, but I thought the reason I actually did that was I wanted to say, let's get it over with. I didn't want to have to look at, oh, four years of school. I thought one book, one test. Now you take more over time as you progress. So I was looking for efficiency. That's what I was looking for. I was looking for, you could get a job and you ace one test, get to the top of the list instead of four years of tests and get a job that might not even have the same benefits. So but that's what I realized as I meditate. I was always looking, let's be efficient. Let's not drag on with life. Let's be efficient with it. And that came to my mind. So I would encourage everybody. Pursue the purpose. When, uh, when David was instructing Solomon in the chapter I mentioned, and he made all the provisions, and David said, God will not allow me to build the temple because I've been a man of war, bloody man in violence. So I'll make provisions for my son Solomon, and he's going to build it. And a wonderful history that I've covered before. But my encouragement to you would be this. I'm, most should realize by now, I'm not into the whole idea of Christianity just being, you know, a positive idea thing that you can make more money, you can do. So much of that is self-focused. I'm more interested in saying, give your life away. Give your life away. For the things that you see, they are temporary. For the things that you do not see, they are eternal. And you'll have an eternal reward. And so, if this is it, if this is the last video... I would say, I would encourage you, pursue the passion and the mission. Not any, you don't get, as a Christian, you don't get to say, I'm going to pick my passion, John. My passion is making a lot of wealth and all. No, your passion is lay your life down. At the end of your life, you say, I made a lot, I ate a lot of good meals. I don't eat a lot of good meals. But uh, uh, what memories are they going to be in heaven?
Oh, hey, brother. God bless you for eating, you know, $1,000 meals. Say, oh, I have all these memories. I ate all these steaks. Well, you know, I just ate once a day. <laughs> Not that I'm any better. But those memories mean nothing. How much you endure throughout your life, they mean nothing at the end. Fulfilling the mission of God means everything at the end. Spreading the gospel of the kingdom to all the ends of the earth. That means everything at the end. And like I already shared in the video, we always wanted to have that mindset. We want to get it done. We don't want to be dragging our feet along. You have so many years. I'll be 62 soon. So you want to get the mission done. You want to be focused on the mission. Pray. Seek God. Read the word of God. Let all things be done decently and in order. I don't attempt to quote that verse every night. It's part of the pattern. It's just, it's like the flow state, if you will. When it's time for me to do that in a session in the evening, every night I quoted that verse. The one I read this morning when I went back to that Chronicles chapter. And that wasn't prepared. Or that was, it got stuck in. The Lord has chosen you to build a house for the ark. Be strong and do it. I like that. So this building of the kingdom of God, it's not some structure of men. You know, we're speaking the gospel into the nations. That people will come to Christ. So I think I covered everything I can. I want to encourage everybody. Uh, please, any of our new friends, I love you all. It, don't be offended. I had some problems with my... Uh, cloud sites because I can't check messages and then I realized Dropbox was leaving me all types of messages no no you got to email me any of these sites I can't check messages on them but if you email or send something to my gmail I'll get that and so some of the sites I think they want to be gracious to me and then they realize oh we messaged him this happened with many of them I said no no message my gmail I can't read them all on these. So, but any of our new friends say, oh, he don't talk. I didn't even see them if you message me, guys. I love you. This is the conversation. This is the only way I could accomplish the way we're doing it. It had to be done this way. Okay, so Father, I thank you for all of our friends. I advocate for the brother. I'm sorry, brother. I can't, I don't remember your name. You're in jail right now. You were from Austin, did the Silk Road. I pray the Lord would do work with you. He's still a writer on Medium, on Instagram. Uh, however, he worked it out. He's in prison. But I pray that the Lord would work. We we ask if any in authority ever see that case, the Silk, Silk Road case. Just pardon the kid. I say kid, he's older now. But he, there was too much wrong in that case. I spoke on many. So uh, let our, there's a scripture, Lord. Let our sentence come forth from before you which is mercy and grace, to build it, to build it with the mercy seat, the grace of God. Father, I pray blessing on everyone. God bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen.